Hello, everyone. How are you? So we will start very shortly. <clears throat> so we are waiting for the IT person. बस में कनेक्टर एचडीएमआई
from the left to the south. Here you have to Is it working? Okay, is everything all right? Thank you. Okay, everyone. Uh, so there are fewer students today here in classroom. That's fine. <clears throat> so last time we talked about uh, one important thing, and that is uh, NFA to DFA. So is it clear to everyone who you uh, do? Do you want me to repeat it? Yes. Um, sir, we did not do empty transitions in this. Yes. So we will do empty transitions uh, as well. <clears throat> okay. So let me. Okay, uh, uh, so actually we did not complete the example. There were so many other missing things that we have to do. So suppose we have a deep, uh, we have an NFA. Okay. So for, for the time being, let's assume that we do not have uh, no empty transitions. Okay. So we will talk about empty transitions after we have introduced a few things, right? Uh, <clears throat> so how do we convert an NFA into DFA? So the, the, the most important thing that we need to consider in conversion of NFA to DFA is that is the uh, set of states. There are two things that we need to be careful, set of states. And the second important thing is the transition part. Okay. So, so over here, I would write uh, the set of states and everything for the NFA. And over here, I would write it for the DFA. So in NFA, we have the set of states Q. In DFA, the set of states would be the power set of Q. And you know what is a power set, right? So transition function is delta here. So let's call it delta uh, NFA. So NFA subscript here tells us that this is the transition function for the, uh, for the NFA. So the transition function for the NFA is between uh, a set some state times the alphabet to the power set of Q, right? While the transition function for the DFA is just Q times sigma times Q, right? So this is the difference. So we need to think about that how to convert this uh, set of states to the power set first of all, and we need to also think about that what to do with the transition function. Okay, so the the <coughs> the uh, Important thing about NFA is that, for example, a state, uh, the, the machine, the non-deterministic machine can be in multiple state at the same time by either reading the same character or even without reading anything. And that is uh, when we talk about the NFA with empty transitions. So right now, just imagine that there are no empty transitions and let's see uh, what happens. <clears throat> uh, so suppose our Q contains three states, one, two, and three. I haven't yet shown what does this NFA look like, but suppose there are three states, one, two, three, then we know that the power set of Q is 
empty set set with just one uh, one of these states one two one three two three in one two and three so we know that there would be eight uh, subsets because there are three elements so two power three is eight so we have eight elements here one two three four five six seven and eight <clears throat> okay so what we do we could suppose we have the nfa and this nfa n is defined or drawn over here it says that suppose when it reads a so suppose sigma is just a and b when it reads a it stays there when it reads a it goes to state number two in the state two it can read a and stay here but it can go to state number three if it reads sorry it can go to state number three if it reads state number three, right in b if it reads a it comes here and if it reads a it can stay here and it can read b and stay here and this is also our final state okay suppose this is our nfa and we need to convert it into dfa so imagine that there exists a dfa m which is equivalent of the n the machine end. So when we say that two machines are equivalent, what does it mean? It means they accept the same kind of language. That is, the language of N must be same as the language of M. Even though N is a non-deterministic machine and M is a deterministic machine, so the languages must be same. So let's convert it. So how can we convert it? So first of all, we need to have eight states in the DFA. Why eight states? Because there were three states in the NFA. Uh, so the power set of three is eight. Uh, so the power set of a set containing three set states contains eight states. So we have to have all those states. So this is the empty state. Uh, this is the state one. This is the state two. This is the state three. Right. Uh, this is the state one and two. This is the state one, three. This is the state two, three. And this is the state one, two, and three. Right. So, <clears throat> so we need to know what is the initial state or the starting state in, in this DFA. So what is the starting state in this uh, NFA? Starting state is one. So in the starting state in NFA is also one. Okay. So we also need to know what is the accepting state. So every state in this NFA that contains three is an accepting state. So where is three? We find three over here. So this is an accepting state or final state. This contains three, so this is also an accepting state. This contains three, so this is also an accepting state. This contains three, so this is also an accepting state. So all those states which contain three are accepting state. Okay, but uh, the only starting state is the one which is exactly the same. Okay, now we need to talk about all the transitions. So we start with empty. So once we start with empty, uh, is, is there any state empty in, uh, in the NFA? No. So there is nothing, it, it doesn't mean uh, that whatever that it reads AB, it remains there. It cannot go out from the state. Now let's talk about uh, one. So since our alphabet contains two elements, A and B, so it means that in this DFA, every state must have two outgoing transitions. One labeled with A and one labeled with B. So when this machine is, so let's let's look at the NFA and when, let's see that when the machine is in state one and it reads A, where does it go? It either stays in one or it goes to two. So what is the union of state one and state two? One, two. So on reading A, it goes to one, two. What happens when the machine is in state one in the NFA and reads two, uh, reads B? Where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere. It goes to null state. Yes. Any question? Okay. 
So we are done with the state one in, in null state and state one. So we are we have labeled all outgoing transitions. So let's go to the next state in state two. So where does the machine go when it reads A? It remains in two, right? So there's a loop over here. Sorry. Where does this machine go when it reads B? It goes to state three. Okay. So we are done with this one. Okay. So let's talk about the next state. That is state one, two. So where does this machine go when it reads A? When it is a state one in the NFA. It goes, it either remains in one or goes to two. So the union of two things is one, two, right? So on, it, it has a self loop. Where does it go when it reads B? It doesn't go anywhere from one, but it goes, uh, it, it goes to state two when it reads. Uh, uh, so from, from, from state two, when it reads B, it goes to three. So we take it. Yes. Any question? Why did we miss? Oh, we missed it. Okay. We will come back. So, so we are done with one, two, and we have we are done with A and B. So let's let's talk about state three. So what happens when the machine is in state three and it reads A? It either stays in state three it go, or goes to two. So it means that it goes to two, three. What happens when the machine is in uh, state three and reads B? Where does it go? It remains in B. No, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So we are done with five states. So let's talk about one, three. When the machine is in state one, reads A, then it stays at one or goes to two. When the machine is in three and it's, it reads A, then it goes, then it remains in three. So what is the union of one, two, and three? Okay. So what, let's talk about what happens when the machine is in three, uh, when the machine is in one, three and reads B. What happens when the machine is in state one and reads B? Nothing. What happens when the machine is in three and reads B? Stays in three. This is what we have. So let's talk about two, three. When the machine is in state two, in reads A, where does it go? It remains in two. When the machine is in state three and reads A, where does it go? It goes to three. So what are the union of two and three? Two, three. So we have a loop. So what happens when the machine is in state two and reads B? It goes to three. What happens with the machine when it is in state three and reads B? Yes. So we are done with this one as well. So let's talk about the next one, one, two, three. So now this is the state that contains all the states. So we have to be careful. So let's see when this machine is in one, reads A, then it, it remains in A or goes to two. So one and two. When the machine is in two, it reads A and goes to, uh, remains in two. When the machine is in three, reads A, then it, so it means that it will have a loop on A. What about B? When the machine is in one, reads B, goes nowhere. When the machine is in two, reads B, it goes to three. When the machine is in, uh, in state three and reads B, it goes to three. So we are done with all the states. Okay, we are done with all the states and this is the DFA. Yes. It can have multiple states. Both NFA and DFA can have multiple states. Yes. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a good question. So, so what happens is we have to carry out this process for each and every state. And once we are done with this process, we need to decide if there is any isolated state. Suppose we find a state which uh, does not connect to anything. Okay, then we can remove it. 
Now, over here, there is a state two. There is a state two. Is there any way we can reach to state two? No. So it means that this is unnecessary state. We can remove it. Okay. There is state one three. Is there any way we can reach to one three? So this is also unnecessary state. So once we remove an unnecessary state, we would also remove all those transitions which are going out of this because there is no coming, uh, there is no incoming transition, right? Uh, and every other state is is such that okay. Now once we remove one three, this transition is removed, right? And this state also becomes useless because there is no other way to come to this state. So this one also is useless, and this is useless. So what we are left with is this state, this state, this state, this state, and this state, and all the corresponding transitions. Okay. Now this is without empty transition. So what happens? Um, sir, we will uh, we will just just consider. Yes. Could you uh, could you quickly repeat that? Repeat what? Uh, uh, how did you choose to remove them? So so we so once we have so we know the power set contains all the subsets of the states, right? So there were three states in the NFA, so there are eight states in the DFA. If there were four states in the NFA, there would be sixteen states in the DFA. So once we have laid down all the states, we will consider all the states and all the transitions that it can support. And once we are done with that process, we will see that if there is any isolated state, for example, there is a state here uh, which does not go, which does not have any outgoing or incoming. So it is not possible that it will not have any outgoing, but it is possible that it might not have any incoming uh, transitions. So, so such a state is this state two, which we deleted. The state two has no way to come, uh, no no incoming transition. So there is no way we can. Or the machine can go to state two. So this is an unnecessary state because it is never going to be used. So we can remove it. Similarly, one three is a state which uh, doesn't have any incoming edges, right? So there is no way we can reach to one three. So we can remove it. And once we remove one three, this state one two three also becomes a state which without any incoming transition. So we can remove this state as well. So so we would have five states. Uh, in our DFA rather than eight states. Clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, so this is without uh, this is considering NFA without empty transitions. So what happens when we have empty transitions? So let let me uh, describe what happens in NFA when we have empty transitions. For example, if we have, uh, let me draw a simple NFA uh, that says that if it reads A. It stays in in this state. Let's call the state one, and uh, it goes to B when it it goes to state two when it reads B. Okay, and from B it can go to state three without reading any empty trunk, without any reading anything. Okay, and this is our final state as well. And over here, if it reads A, it's fine. It comes here. Uh, and we don't care about B, what happens with B. Okay. So in this case, in this case, imagine uh, I pass a string which is A, B. Okay. Suppose this is the machine N, and does this string A, B belong to L of N? Yes or no? Why? Exactly. So the first character is A. So A will keep the machine in state one. And the second character is B. And B will take the machine to two. And from two, it can take an empty transition to, to go to state three. Right? So how do we know that some string is accepted by an NFA? So this is important. Uh, so what we need to know is is called the empty closure. Empty closure is is a concept uh, which says that suppose I have a state Q, okay, and we are talking about NFA, NFA with empty transitions, right? 
So suppose there is a state Q, small Q in, 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 in our NFA. Then we define the empty, empty closure of a state Q. Okay. Empty closure of state Q is Q itself plus union all those states where machine can go with empty transitions. Where machine can go with empty transitions. So we define it for one state, but it, it doesn't have to be defined for one state. We can define it for multi, multiple states. Let's suppose uh, Q prime is a subset of Q. Okay. Then empty transition of Q prime is the union of empty transitions of all Qs which are in Q prime. Okay. So we take the empty transition of every state that is in this set and we union them. Okay. So empty transition, empty closure is, 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 is important in a sense that it tells us that where the machine can go without taking any transition. So once we have an NFA with empty transition, so what happens is that when we have to convert our transition function for the NFA, to a transition function for the DFA, we don't just convert or we don't just find what states this machine will go. Once we find those state, we include those states plus we take the empty transition. Okay, so let me give you a very simple example with two states and I think it will uh, be clear that what, what I'm trying to say. Uh, suppose this is state one and this is state two. Okay, it reads A. Okay, so this is NFA, the state one machine reads A, it stays at A, but it can go to two because there is an empty transition. So, so the transition function, when we convert this NFA into DFA would be, so for example, suppose we, first of all, we have uh, just two states, so we would have four states in our uh, DFA. So one of the states is the empty, the other state is one, the other state is two, and the other state is one, two. Right? So this one is just A. So when the machine is in one, when the machine is in one, it reads A. Where does it go? It stays in one or it goes to two. So so previously, without empty transition, it would just go to, it will just go to one, it will self loop. But now it will not do a self loop, rather it will go to one. Two. Okay, and since there's only one uh, character in the alphabet, so we will proceed from one to, it will have a loop. Okay, it will have a loop and, and that's it. Now this state is not used, this state is not used, and this is our starting state, and this is our uh, DFA. So the, can, so the equivalent DFA is a DFA that contains one state, and it says that it has one transition because the alphabet contains uh, one element, and it goes there. Okay. Suppose if it was the final state, so this becomes our final state. So what is the language of this machine? Can you write a regular expression for this language? Yes. Yeah, so, so there is one minor mistake here. So I think this will also be done. Uh, 
So it also become, uh, so this is basically A star and this is also A star. Anyway, so let's move on. So empty um, sir, yes. Uh, before we move on, could you kindly explain the empty closure definition that we wrote earlier? Yeah, so the empty closure definition is very simple. So suppose there is some state Q in our set of state, then empty closure of the state Q is the set of all states where the machine can go with empty transition. Including Q, including Q. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any any other question? So let me see if uh, there are any questions on the chat. Uh, it goes to one and two, not just two. But it, Um, sir. Yes. Uh, do we need to show the starting state for the DFA uh, after we have converted it from the NFA? Uh, again, can you repeat the question? Um, do we need to show the starting state of the DFA after we have converted it from the NFA? Yeah, every every DFA has a starting state, so we need to know which state is the starting state. Um, so uh, have we shown it till yet? Yeah, we did. So see, I, I have this arrow over here that shows this is the starting state. In the previous example, we also had this arrow. Can you see this arrow? Yes, sir. Right. Right. Thank you. Yes. This one? MP said what? Uh, because, okay. Uh, so empty set, empty state is a state which usually does not have any outgoing uh, transitions. Why? Because there is no state in our, in our NFA which is like empty, right? So it's it's a kind of sync state or a trash state or whatever you want to call it, delete state or error state. So once the machine goes goes in that state, it cannot go out, right? It's a kind of black hole. So. So once the machine is in there, it doesn't matter how many transitions it's take. Uh, since it's a DFA, so we need to show all the transitions. That's it. Okay. So suppose I have a language A and uh, before, before, even before that. Suppose I have uh, my alphabet a is zero and one, okay, just zero and one. So all the strings over this alphabet, alphabet would be binary strings. Now suppose there's a language L, which is of the form zero N one N, such that N is a natural number. So first of all, question number one, uh, show some strings in L. And question number two, show some strings not in L. Can you tell me uh, what are some, some states which are in this language L? Zero one is there. Zero zero one one is there. So zero, 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 one, one, one is there. Empty is also there because zero is a natural number. And if N is zero, then it means no zeros and no ones. It's, it's also there. And so, so many, right? There are infinitely many. Can you tell me some strings which are not in this language? Zero, one, one is not there. One, zero, one is not there. One, one, zero is not there. One, zero is not there. Okay? So these are all the strings which are not in this language. And there are infinitely many strings which are not in this language. 
Question number three, the most important question. Can you design uh, an, an NFA for this language or a DFA for this language? Can you do that? Sir, earlier you told us that uh, our automaton can only, it actually has a limited memory, right? Yes. So it cannot be count of the number of zeros and the number of ones to make sure that the number of zeros and ones are equal in the string. Yes. So I guess we cannot make any any uh, NFA or DFA for this one? Yes, we cannot. So, so you are saying that we can? Who? Oh. Can we can we create a DFA for this? How? Okay. So the thing is that uh, so if you remember one of the results that we uh, discussed earlier on was the was about regular languages. And finite automata. That is, a language is regular if and only if it can be recognized or accepted by a finite automata. Right? So if you construct a finite automaton which accepts a language, that language has to be regular. If even if you do not know anything about the language, that language must be regular. And if you know if you already know that a language is regular, then there must exist some DFA which will uh, accept or recognize it, right? So the thing is that this language is, is, is a language which is very hard to, I mean, it's, it's impossible to construct a DFA. Why it is impossible to construct a DFA? Uh, the thing is that this N over here actually tells us that this language has, so every string in this language has same number of zeros and same number of, same number of zeros and one. And all the zeros come before one. And since we do not know what is this n, right? So this n is a natural number. So it could be zero, it could be one, it could be three, it could be hundred, it could be million. It could be a huge number, right? It could be a small number, it could be a huge number. So, so for example, imagine there is, there exists a DFA which accepts this language. Okay? Imagine, uh, assume that this, this is, uh, there exists a machine, a DFA that accepts this language. So it means that that machine must read the first zero. Imagine there are some finite number of zeros and then exactly the same number of ones after the zeros. So the machine would read the first zero, then it will read the second zero, then it will read the third zero and so on till the last zero. But once it reads all the zeros, it has to know how many zeros it has read, right? So that it can read exactly the same number of ones. Because if there is one, one less one or one more one in, in, in the string, then the string should not be accepted. The number of ones should be exactly the number of zeros, right? Because we have zero n, one n, right? So once it, once it was reading zeros, it has to know or it has to count or it has to keep a track of the number of zeros it has already encountered. And that would require some amount of memory available to, to the machine. And we know that DFAs do not have any additional memories apart from whatever the state it has. It is in, right? So once the machine reaches a state, it does not remember where does it come from. So let me give you an example. Suppose there is a DFA, and I'm not going to detail of what this DFA is. Just imagine there's a DFA in which there's one state here, there's one state here, there's one state here, there's one state here, and there's one state here, right? So suppose this state one uh, or A, B, C, and D, when the machine is in state D, does it know if it came from state B or state C? There is no way we can keep track of this information inside this DFA, which will tell, uh, tell us that where, where did it come from? So, so the, the only memory it can store is what is the current state and what will be the next state depending on the character it is reading from the input. That is the only information this machine has. No other information. That's why this 
F in the definition or the name of the machine comes from. It is a very, very limited, finite amount of memory available. And in order to recognize or accept this language, we need finitely many, uh, many things, right? Actually, we need infinitely, infinite amount of memory because you do not know what this n could be. It could n could be any number. It could be infinitely large, right? So it means that we cannot construct a DFF for it. So this is an argument uh, which we use to show that this language is not regular. So we would say that L is not regular, right? Yes. No, there is no power set here. This is language, not states. Yeah. No. Transitions, I mean, we start with the language and we try to construct a DFA for that. So this is a legitimate language, right? This is proper language defined over some alphabet. And we know that we can write a program in, in Java or Python or any programming language, which will accept the strings in this language, right? Any string of any length, it can accept it. Uh, so the point over here is that the DFA is not capable of recognizing this, even the simple language, right? So this N uh, is an indicator over here that since N could be any large number and DFA cannot hold that much amount of memory, so it is impossible, right? So it means that this language is not regular. So we have seen so many languages which are regular. Now this is a language which is not regular. It means that there are languages which are not regular. So let me write a few more languages and I will ask this question whether these languages are regular or not. So you can think uh, in, in, in these terms whether you can construct a machine or, for that or not. Suppose there's a language C and similarly we again have zero and one as the alphabet. C is a language which contains strings W such that W has an equal number of zeros and ones. And I have another language D, which contains strings W, such that W has an equal number of zero one and one zeros. Substrings. What do you think about C? Is C a regular language or not? Is D a regular language or not? If yes, how? If no, why? So is C a regular language or not? No, anyone in this class over here or online says that C is, is regular. Are you sure? It's not previous language, it's different. So suppose in the previous language, one zero was not in the language while zero one was in the language, right? So in the previous language, uh, zero one zero one was not in the language, but zero one zero one is in C, right? So is C regular or not? Yes or no? Anyone who says no? Everyone? Online, anyone who says no? Yes, it's, it's uh, not yes, regular. Sir, no, not regular. it's not regular. Okay, anyone who says yes, it is regular? Is there anyone who says yes, it is regular? Okay, uh, Shahir Ahmed. Yes, you say it's regular. Can you tell me why? Or how? Sir, my opinion is that if we put two states in a loop where one is going to go there, one is going to go there, one is going to go there, and 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 one is going to go there. Okay, so how would you construct a DFA for that? Sir, we will make a state. 
Or so we'll take from the first state to the second state, uh, we will take uh, either a one or a zero. Dono, zero. So zero. And also a one, so don't uh, don't And then pop is uh, one or zero. So we come back to the first state? Yes, sir. One. And okay. if we sir, accept both of them. And what will be the uh, accepting state? Sir, a certain mechanism is not going to work. Not That's correct. correct. Sir, if we have self loop, if we have second state, ko accept. So, self loop, how will we make Second state, we will self loop. Zero one. Ka. Zero one. Or? Or first state to second state, we have zero one. Ka Is this correct? Ka. This is not correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. But the problem, there's a problem. So it means that it can only accept 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. It cannot accept 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Right? So how to make, how to change it? It's very easy. We can actually modify this machine to accept the language. So let's see how we can do that. Start with a string, uh, start with a state. And if it reads zero, you come here. So it means the machine has read one zero. In order for this machine to, in order for this machine to accept the string, it must read exactly the same number of ones. And this must be accepting state. This is when the first character is zero. But what if the first character is one? So we can have the similar thing here and zero, right? So when it reads one, it goes to this temporary in, in intermediate state, reads zero. Now, uh, so every state has the uh, both outgoing transitions, right? Zeros and ones. So this one has zero, this one has one, this one has one, and this one has zero, but there is still one possibility. What happens when this machine is in this state and reads zero? So what to do? So it means when, when the machine reads zero over here, it means this is the second zero. So it has to read third, how many third, ones? Third state. 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 Self state. Trap, trap state. Trap state. Third state. But no, it's not. It is possible. Uh, that a machine reads zero zero one one is an acceptable thing, right? Zero zero. No, this machine is undefined for zero zero. Self loop is a, is a problem because self loop does not have any upper bound, right? Yes. So what to do? Um, sir, we are trying this for D, right? For part D? No, we are for trying the for C. D. We are trying for C. We are trying for C, but sir, that to... So the problem is that, for example, the machine enters in this state, it means it has already read one zero, right? And it can read one and it will be okay. But the thing is that what if it reads another zero? If it reads another zero, you would say, come here, and now it has to read two ones. And you say that, okay, it will read two one and come here. But what, what happens when it reads zero over here? Right, so it will keep increasing, right? So it, it seems, C is not regular. 
Okay. So yes, is there anyone else who thinks that C is regular? Still thinks that C is regular? Yes. Exactly. That's why I'm saying that if it reaches third zero, it will grow. Then we will solve it for three zeros. Then we have to solve it for four zeros. Then we have to solve it for five zeros. In order to solve it for all possible zeros and ones, this machine would have infinite states, and it's no longer finite states. So C is not regular. Right. Okay, what about D? D is regular. D is a language that contains strings W such that W has equal number of zero ones and one zeros as the substrings. Uh, again, how? Probably, let's see. So, if I remove uh, this one. So it has same number of zero one and one zero. And no, it's not the right uh, thing because what if zero one zero one? Is it acceptable from this machine or not? It is. Is it in D or not? It is not in D, right? But D is still regular. I'm not going to show you how. Think about it. And if you're stuck, we will talk about it. So let, let me uh, show you one result. So it's not just that um, we use our intuition and try and trial and error method to see that whether a language is regular or not. We have an important result. And I will tell you the name later. So the result says that if a language A is regular language, then there exist then there's a number p we call this number p the pumping length where if S is any string A of length at least P, then S may be divided into three pieces. S is equal to X, Y, and Z, satisfying the following conditions. Condition number one, for each I greater than or equal to zero, X, Y, I, Z is in A. Condition number two, length of y is non-zero and length of x y has to be less than or equal to okay. this is called pumping lemma for regular language So this is a very important result and this result is used to prove 
languages are not trackable. So what is this lemma? It says that, it, so it is a property, a pumping lemma is a property of regular languages. Imagine A is a regular language, okay? If A is a regular language, then there are certain conditions for this language A to be, because we know that finite languages are, all, all finite languages are regular languages, but over here we are talking about infinite regular languages, right? So a language has to be infinite. It doesn't apply to, to the finite languages. So if a language is regular, if it is infinite uh, regular language, then for every infinite regular language, we can find a number P. We do not know what this number is, but we can find a number P, okay? And we call this number P the pumping length, okay? That is, if we can find a string which is in the language, okay, such that it has at least of the length P of this pumping length, okay? Then we can divide this string S into three parts and find the middle part such that we can pump it as many times as possible, okay? Such that these three conditions hold. We can prove this theorem, we will prove this theorem, but not very formally, I will show you an informal proof. Uh, and this proof actually relies on a very simple effect, uh, which I hope that you all know, uh, which is called Do you remember pigeonhole principle? Have you studied pigeonhole principle? Nope. Seriously? Not in discrete mathematics or any other course? No one? Okay, pigeonhole principle is a very simple principle. Uh, what does it say? It says that the statement is very simple. It says that if there are more pigeons than pigeonholes, then some of the pigeonholes must contain more than one pigeon. Very simple, right? So, so if there are, uh, let's say, so you can you can think about it from uh, the point of view of uh, letters and letter boxes. For example, if there are letter boxes, empty letter boxes, there are let's say ten letter boxes, and you have fifteen letters. So if you put 15 letters in those letter boxes, so, there's, so there are many distributions that you can do. You can put all those 15 in one of the letter boxes or two of the letter boxes or three of the letter boxes, or you might decide to use all of the letter boxes. But even if you use all of the letter boxes, since there are more letters than the letter boxes, some of the letter boxes would contain more than one letters, right? So this is exactly the pigeonhole principle. Right? It's, it's a mathematical principle, it's a theorem, it, which actually is used to prove many results in, in uh, mathematics and computer science. So this is not the right place to uh, go into details about pigeonhole principle, uh, but this is the statement and I will uh, share some link where you can read more about it. Uh, there are some other versions of uh, pigeonhole principle and there are other uh, variations, weak versions and, and other things. Uh, but we would use a kind of pigeonhole principle to prove this theorem. So since we are dealing with machines, which we call finite automata, right? And we are dealing with regular languages, which are infinite. So this is finite and this is infinite, right? So a language could be infinite, not only that it has infinitely many strings, also the length could be arbitrary. Right? So let me show you a very simple DFA, which recognizes a language of, which recognizes an arbitrary language. Okay. A very simple DFA. Suppose the sigma is AB. Okay. So this simple DFA contains two states, just two states. Two is a finite number, not just finite, it's a very small number, right? While the strings that are accepted by this machine are, they could be infinitely long. What are those strings which can be accepted by this machine? What? Oh, sorry. What are the, what are the strings that can be accepted by this machine? 
a star b t star right so this is, this could be an infinitely long because then you have in so many a's maybe 100 maybe 500 maybe 1000 a million then just one b and there could be uh, millions of b again right so the smallest possible string accepted by this machine contains one symbol and the large there is no uh, there is no bound yes Oh, oh, sorry. So it, it can have A's and B's. A's and B's. Anything. Yes, this is not correct. So, okay, I, I thought about B. So it is A star, B, A plus B star. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for that. So, but this is, uh, the point is that this is an infinite language. Not only that, uh, this language contains infinitely many strings, uh, but the strings, every string in this language could be of uh, arbitrary length. One, two, three, five, five hundred, one million, one trillion, so on, so on, so forth. While the machine only has two strings, right? So imagine sending a string. So I, I will write a string and I will say that what happens. So the string is A, A, B, 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 maybe A. So how many, uh, how many characters do you have in this string? Six. How many states we have in this machine? Two. So it means that once we pass, so the machine starts in the starting state, it reads the first A. It stays in the same state, it reads the second A, it stays in the same state, and so on. Then it reads B, it goes to the next state, then it reads all the Bs and it stays in the same state. Then it reads A, last A, and it stays in the same state. So it means that even though the, the uh, even though the, the accepting string contains more symbols than the number of states, some of the states are being used multiple times. And if they can be used multiple times, then they can be used in an arbitrary number of multiple times. You don't have to use just one. You can use it for twice, thrice, four, five, and any number of times. So for example, I say that this is the string. Uh, suppose this is the string that this machine accepts. ABA is accepted, right? ABA is accepted. Is it possible that I can accept A, B, B, A from this machine? This is also accepted. So I can pump one B in this string and the string is accept still accepted. I can not only pump one B, I can pump two or three or 10 or any arbitrary number of Bs in the string and the string is still acceptable. That's exactly what the pumping lemma says. It says that if we have an infinite language, infinite regular language. So the, this is the necessary condition. If the language A is infinite regular language, then it is possible to find a string in this language, which has the, which has some minimum criteria of, of the length. And if you find such a string, then you can always divide this string into three parts, such that if you, you can pump the middle part as many times as you want. You can either remove this metal part or pump it once, twice, thrice, 10 times, 100 times, a million times or infinitely many times. And the resulting state, the resulting string would still be in the language. That's, this is exactly what it says by the pumping lemma. And since this pumping lemma contains only if, it's not if and only if. So it says that if a language is regular, it must hold these three conditions. We must be able to pump these things. Right, and if we cannot pump, it means the language is not regular. So in order to prove that a language is not regular, we use pumping lemma to show that it is impossible to pump. Therefore, the language is not regular. So it does not say that if the language is not regular, we cannot apply pumping lemma. We can still apply pumping lemma. It says that if the language is regular, we can apply. It does not say anything about if the language is not regular. What it says is if the language is not regular, Okay, if we apply the pumping lemma, then if so, so, so something like this. So I, I hope that you have done this in logic in, uh, in, in discrete mathematics. So if we have, we have the statement like if P, then Q. This means that if not Q, then not P. 
right? If the language is regular, we can apply pumping lemma. If we cannot apply pumping lemma, we can, we, the language is not regular. It does not say anything about if Q, then P. It does not say anything about it. If you can apply pumping lemma, it does not mean the language is regular. Okay, is this thing clear? This is very simple logic. P implies Q is logically equivalent to not Q implies not P. P implies Q is not logically equivalent to Q implies P. These two are two different things. We can only do that if the statement contains if and only if. If it just contains if, we cannot do that. If it contains if, we can do this, but not this. Okay, so I think we can take a break for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, we can come back and uh, talk about more things. Okay, so uh, I have uh, covered the proof uh, of lemma. So the proof of the lemma is in slides, right? Uh, I will just give you an overview that uh, why this proof makes sense. And uh, yes, uh, Abdullah, there is. Uh, you have raised your hand. You have any questions? Uh, yes, sir. I wanted to ask that. Uh, could you kindly explain the third condition for the pumping lemma before we move on? Sure, sure. So let us try to understand uh, the theorem one more time. Theorem says that this is a lemma, not theorem. Uh, so this this lemma says that if A is a regular language. If A is a regular language and uh, so it says that suppose A is an infinite regular language and if it is an infinite like regular language, you can always find a number P. Okay. And this number P is called the pumping length such that you can find a string in the language of at least length P. At least length p means that it has the length exactly as p, or it is it is bigger than p. Suppose p is in your case is two, then you have a string of length two or more. If if the if the length p is let's say ten, uh, then the string is of length ten or eleven or twelve or any anything less than anything greater than ten. Right. So if a is a infinite regular language, uh, then you can find a number p such that if you find a string of length at least p which is in this language, then you can break that string S into three parts, X, Y, Z. Okay. And once you break this part, you have, you can break this part in this, in such a fashion, then, so the first two parts, so the third condition says the first two parts X and Y should not compose the entire string. Right. So, I mean, it should not be that Okay, so let, let me explain this in, in some words. It, it would be easier if I, if I can do that. Suppose A is a regular language. Okay, A is a regular language. And suppose A is a language uh, which is defined by a regular expression. And that regular expression is this. Zero, star, one, zero star. It is very simple language. We just considered this language. Suppose the alphabet is zero. Okay. Can you uh, draw automate for this? Yes, you can. And this would be the automate. Right. This is an NFA. 
<coughs> this is an NFA which accepts zero star one, zero star. So we know that since there is just an NFA, so this must be regular language. And if it is regular language, and definitely it is regular language, and it's not just simple regular language, it is an infinite regular language. So it means that we can apply, we can apply the pumping lemma. Okay, so if you can apply pumping lemma, it means that we can find, we can find some number P, which we would call pumping length. We do not know what is the pumping length for this uh, language is right now, but there must exist some pumping. And without even exploring, and this theorem does not tell us anything about uh, what this length could be, right? It, this theorem, this lemma does not tell us anything about uh, the length. It is not a constructive theorem. So, so imagine there exists some pumping length. We do not know what is the length, but there exists a pumping length. Then it says that find a string in A of length at least P. Okay. Find a string of length at least P. Imagine S is a string which is of length P. And let's suppose S is uh, zeros, all the way zeros, then we have one, and then we have all the way zeros. There are P zeros, let's say P minus one zeros, and P minus one zeros. What is the length of this S? It is greater than P. Why? Because the length of this string is two times prime P minus one plus one, right? Which is which is much bigger than P. Remember, we do not know what is this P, what this number P is, but we know that the string that we have found or the string that we have uh, manufactured is, is of length at least P. And we know that this string is in the language P. It's just arbitrary. We just wanted to make it, uh, we, we wanted to find a string such that this string is in the language and the, the length of the string is at least P. Okay. And later on, you will find that it, this, uh, this method may not work all the way. So we have to do it a couple of times before we can find. So it's, it's most of the time uh, trial and error. So, so this is a string. So let's go back to the conditions and see that uh, what are those conditions that this string must exhibit. It says that the string can be divided into, if you can find such a string, it can be divided into x, y, z, such that for each i greater than or equal to zero, for i equal to zero, one, two, three, for any uh, natural number, x, y, i, z must be in, in A. Okay. So let's say over here, I say this x, s is equal to zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. Okay. I say this part is x, this part is y, and this part is z. I can do it, right? I can do it. <clears throat> Let's not put it this way. Let's say this is. This part is x, this is y, and this is z. So x is 0, 0, 0, y. Okay. So the length of this is p minus 1, this length is just 1. So length of x is equal to p. Okay. y is just 1, so length of y is equal to 1. And what is z? z is 0, 0, 0. And how many zeros we have? p minus 1. So let's go back to the condition and see that if these three conditions are these three conditions hold or not. So forget about this condition number one, we will come back. So let's talk about condition number two. Is the length of y non-zero? Is the length of y positive? Yes, length of y is positive. Okay. Uh, is uh, x, y, the length of x, y at least p or not? Yes, it is p. So let's see.
so so let let me uh, okay let me explain it again so i say that the first part first all zeros and one is x how many zeros we have in this s initially t minus 1 right so these are t minus 1 and how many one we have just one so what is the length of x t minus 1 plus 1 which is equal to t what is y y is just zero what is the length of y one what is z zero zero what is the length of z t minus 2 why right? because we have used one of the zeros in in y okay so what was the three conditions so there was condition number 1 we will come back to this condition number 1 condition number 2 was that length of y must be greater than 0 and the and the condition number 3 was that the length of x and y must be less than equal to b okay so what is x so let me write x and y over here so x is 0 0 0 0 to 1 okay and y is just 0 since y contains one character so it is not 0 it is greater than 0 this condition is valid since x contains p minus 1 zeros and just one one so what is the length of this x exactly p so p is less than equal to p is true so both these conditions are valid so let's come back to the first condition the first condition says that uh first condition let let's see let's see what does it say formally for each i greater than equal to 0 this must be a string so let's go back for each i greater than equal to 0 x y i z must be in the language a okay what is the language a language a is 0 star 1 0 star right so it means that when y is raised to the power i i could be 0 i could be 1 i could be 2 i could be 4 it could be anything right so it means that just write this string zeros 1 okay then how many y's we can have any number of y's so what is y y equal to 0 how many y's we can have let's say we have three y's then we have z what is z z is again zeros how many zeros we have t minus 2 does this string belong to a or not it does belong to a because it says that zero star one zero star so we have zero star so this is zero star then we have one and then we have zero star so this belongs to language a and we know that it doesn't matter if we have three zeros we can have zero zeros one zeros two zeros three zeros four zeros any number of zeros and for every possible i which is greater than equal to 0 the resulting string is again in the language therefore we can apply we can successfully apply the pumping law okay and remember we did not compromise on what is p we do not know what is p without even knowing p we were able to find out a string of length at least p is it sir yes sir how is the length of x y less than or equal to p because the length of x is exactly equal to oh yes so let me make it little bit different here so let me make it e minus 2 and e minus 1 now it it makes sense uh, because we wanted to satisfy these conditions it's okay we can do that as long as all the conditions are satisfied we can do that okay exactly yes yes we will do some examples and it will be clear i have done some examples in the slides you can look at those examples some other examples are also in the book so read so have you have you found the book Have you downloaded the book? It is available online, so you can download it. The PDF is available, so download. So yes, thank you very much for this uh, pointing out this thing. So now I've I've made some small changes, and now this condition number three holds, condition number two holds, and condition number one also holds.
Is this thing clear? So can you please repeat condition number one? The last thing he wrote. Sure. So for that, let me repeat all three conditions because it will be easier. So let me write all these three conditions here. For each i greater than or equal to zero, x, y, i, z must be in the language A. Condition number two, the length of y must be greater than zero. And condition number three, the length of x, y must be less than or equal to zero. Okay. So let me write the language. So language is zero star one zero star. It's an infinite regular language. So if it is infinite regular language, we should be able to apply the pumping lemma. And if you are able to apply pumping lemma, then there must exist a pumping length P such that we can find a string S in language L such that the length of S is at least P. Sorry, at least not at most. Right. So we should be able to find such a string. So let's try to construct such a language, such a string. You have something important? Can you ask me? What is what is that you cannot understand? So let I, I'm repeating the whole thing, right? So please pay attention. So this is condition one, this is condition two, this is condition three. This is the language. We do not know what is P, so let's imagine this this some number P. We do not know what number, but some number P. So we have for this number P, we have to find some string such that the length of this string is at least p. It can be more than p, but it has to be at least p. So we can construct a string of length p. Now, we can construct many strings, which satisfy, right? So we can construct a string that contains uh, exactly length p. We can construct a string that contains length exactly p plus 1, p plus 2, or p plus 3, or whatever we want to find. We can do that. So we will come up with some numbers which, which are easier for us to manage and which satisfy all these three conditions, okay? So as an easy case, I say, okay, imagine string S is a string such that it contains some zeros, then one, and then some zeros. It is not necessary that the zeros before one and zeros before after, uh, zeros after one come in exactly the same quantity because it's just star. Star doesn't guarantee the same quantity, right? So the quantities can be different. So let's stick with that, that the quantities are different. The only condition we have to, the only condition we need to care about right now is that this string S must be of length at least P, okay? And we do not know what is this P. So we can say, okay, imagine uh, we have P minus two zeros here. And imagine we have uh, P minus, let's imagine that we have P zeros. It doesn't matter how many zeros we have. P zeros. Okay. So what is the length of S here? P minus 2 plus 1 plus P, right? Which is equal to 2P minus 1. 2P minus 1 is greater than or equal to P. Right? Because P is a natural number. Right? Since P is a natural number, so 2P minus 1 is greater than equal to P for sure. So this condition is satisfied. Now we will try to satisfy all these three conditions which are required by the lemma and see that can we satisfy or not. Okay? So we will come to the condition number 1 at the, at the end. So let's try to satisfy condition number 2. Is condition number 2 satisfied? So first we need to break this string S into X, Y, Z. So S is this one. So I would so I would I would say that the first all zeros and one make up X. Then next zero is Y and then remaining zeros are Z. Okay, what are those X, Y, and Z? X is zero, 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 all the way is the last one and then one. How many zeros we had? P minus two. Okay, so what is the length of X here? P minus two plus one, which is? P minus one. Okay. What is Y here? Y, y is equal to zero. What is length of Y? One. What is Z here? Zero all the way till the end. How many zeros we had originally? P. We have already used one zero in Y. So how many zeros we have? P minus one. Okay. Is the second condition satisfied? Is the length of Y greater than zero? 
Yes, one is greater than zero, so satisfied. Is the sec is the third condition satisfied? X Y. What is X Y? So concatenation of X and Y. So this is a string X. This is a string Y. So what is X Y? So X Y is equal to zero all the way till last zero, then one, then zero. Okay. What is the length of X Y? P minus one plus one. P minus one plus one is P. So length of X Y is equal to P, which is at, mo at least p every number is at most itself right so p is greater than or equal to p so this condition sorry every number is at least itself so condition number three is also satisfied condition number two satisfied condition number three satisfied so let's go and check condition number one the condition number one says that for every i greater than or equal to zero that is i equal to zero one two three and every number this string should be in the language. Okay, so let's check if this string is in the language or not. Okay, so let me write the condition one here once again. For all i greater than or equal to zero, uh, x, y, y, i, z must be in the language. Okay. Okay, so what is the smallest possible value of i? i equal to zero. If the smallest possible value of i equal to zero, then y is, what is y? y is zero, so y power zero is empty string. y power one is just zero. What is y squared? Zero, zero. What is y cube? Zero, zero, zero. What is y power four? Zero, 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 and so on and so forth, right? So we should be able to do all of this for i equal to zero or one or two or three or four and so on and so forth. Right. So let's check. If I plug this y power zero in my original string, is this string still in the language or not? So we have x, y, zero, z. What is x? Zero, 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 one, and then zero, zero, zero. Right. So how many zeros we will have before one? We are not changing anything. It's still p minus two. And how many zeros we would have after uh, one? P minus one, because one of them was inside zero, inside y, and we have removed y. Is this in language A or not? It is in language A, right? So let's see what happens if I have just one y. We already know that this is already the language. What about y squared? Y squared would be zeros all the way. Then we have one. Then we would have zero. Then we have another zero because of y squared, and then we would have remaining zeros. How many remaining zeros? P minus one. So we have two more. So P minus one plus two is P plus one. Is this string in language A or not? Yes. So we have shown that it works for zero. It, it works for one. It works for three. And we can do, we can apply an induction. We say that it, it works for every possible value of i. And therefore condition one also applies. And since all three conditions applies, it means that we can successfully apply on big number. Yes. What is the? So it means that our our choice of x, y, z is not correct because we know that the language is regular, but we are not able to apply it. Means that there is some mistake in our choice of the string s or its breakup. Yes, that's a very good question. And that question has to be answered in such a way that we have to show that no such assignment of, uh, no such breakup of S into X, Y, Z, or no such breakup of assigning different parts of string to different parts of X and Y, Z can work. If it cannot work for any such combination, then definitely the language is not correct. So we have to show that no such assignment exists. Okay, and we will do some languages which are not regular, and we will show that uh, how we cannot apply complex now. Okay, so let's come back to our example of a language A uh, that was zero n one n such that n is in n is a natural number. We know that A is not regular. Right, we know that A is not regular. So if 
A is regular, not, let's not use A. If L is regular, then we can apply pumping lemma. If cannot apply pumping lemma, then L is not regular, right? So we do not know whether this L A is regular or not because we know this is not regular, but suppose you come up with this language and you do not know whether it is regular or not, you would try to apply the pumping lemma. And if you fail to apply pumping lemma, that will show us that A is not regular. So how can we apply pumping lemma? Since it's in finite language, so we assume, so we assume, so first assumption, suppose A is regular. So it's approved by contradiction. Yes. No, no, why not? No, last last language was regular and we were, we were still able to break it into XYZ. This is not regular. Why not? Which lay maybe the zero one thing? Doesn't matter. Because languages can, can 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 come in any shape, and alphabet doesn't have to be limited to just two characters, right? It can have three, four, five, ten, hundred, any number of characters, right? So we know that this language is not regular, but forget about this for a second. Suppose we do not know that this is not regular. So in order to apply pumping lemma, our assumption is that assume suppose A is regular. Because if a language is regular, we can apply pumping lemma. So if it if if A is regular, then we should be able to apply pumping. Lemma. And if we cannot apply pumping lemma, it means that our assumption was not correct and A is not regular. So this is called proof by contradiction. So let's try to prove it by contradiction. So if A is regular and since A is infinite, so there must exist exist some number p such that we can find a string of length at least p such that S is in language A. And those three conditions should apply, right? So you remember those three conditions, right? So let's try to figure out what are the strings which are acceptable, right? So if I say that S is zero power P, one power P, is it, is this language, is this string in language A or not? Yes or no? Yes, why? First of all, it contains all the zeros before all the ones. And the number of zeros is exactly the number of ones. And the length of the whole string is 2p, which is at least p. Right? So this string is in language A. Right? Now we have three conditions. Condition one, condition two, condition three. So let's talk about condition two. So first of all, before we go to conditions, we need to break this string S into three parts x, y, z. So let's break this string in x, y, z. Okay? How do we break it? So let's break. So there are multiple ways we can break it. So let's break it this way that X is all, all zeros except the last zero. So there are P minus one zeros. Then we have one more zero, right? So, sorry. Then we have one more zero. So Y is equal to, yes, it doesn't matter. So this is how we define this space. So there are P zeros and P ones. So P minus one zeros are in X. Last zero is in Y and all the ones are in C. Okay. So what does condition number two? Y should be positive length. Is it correct or not? Yes, there is one character. So condition two passes. What is the third condition? X, Y must be less than equal to P. Is it? P minus one plus one is P. So yes, second, third condition is also satisfied. What is the third condition? For all possible values of I greater than or equal to zero, X, Y, I, Z must be in language A, right? So let's see if it is the case or not. When, so it means that I equal to zero must hold. 
i equal to zero means that we remove this one. So we would have zero. Then we have one. We have p minus one zeros and p ones. Is this in language A? No. So it fails even for for the very basic thing where i equal to zero. And you can see that it will only pass for i equal to one. It will fail on i equal to zero. It will fail on i equal to one, uh, i equal to two, i equal to three. For every possible value of i which is not equal to one, it will fail. While it says that it has to pass for every possible value, while it is passing only on one value, so it means that we cannot apply pumping lemma in this language is not regular. Why? Because we assume this is regular, so we should be able to apply pumping lemma. And since we cannot apply, so the the assumption is is wrong. And this is not right. Yes. No, I don't understand. What if we if we what if we take y as zero one? Okay, that's perfect. That's a very good question. So if you take y equal to zero one. Then it says that x, y, z for every possible value of i must be in the language, right? So you would have zero, zero, zeros. Then you would have zero, one. Then you would have zero, one, and then all the ones, because y square is equal to zero, one, zero, one. And this is not in, this is not in language, right? So no matter what is your choice of x, y, and z, you cannot apply for it. And this is just one example, and we can prove it by induction that it is not possible, right? And and therefore this language is not right. It is not the, this specific choice of x, y, and z which make it not regular. Rather, all choices will make it not right. And it's it seems true in a sense that think about pumping lemma is that you. Uh, you fix on some substring of sub on substring and try to pump that substring as many times as possible. So if your y contains just zeros, then you in, in at the end you will have more zeros than ones. If your y contains just ones, then you will have more ones than zeros. If your y contains zero and one both, then they will not be in order. So these are the only three possible things, right? So you even do not have to apply induction. I hope you know mathematical induction, right? So even you do not have to apply mathematical induction. So you, since there are only three possible cases, so therefore this language is not correct. Any other question? Okay, so let me uh, write some languages, and I will ask you to prove whether they are regular or not. So suppose that I have a language F that contains W, W, such that W okay. is this regular or not? So this says that it contains all strings of zeros and ones such that you can break this string in half. And so you have actually two copies of the same string. So, for example, zero one zero one is an F, right? Zero 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 is an F. So all the strings that you will find in this language will be of even length, because you have you can break it in half, and then you will have an image over here, right? The positive image. So you can break here, and you have zero one here. You can have zero one. So it doesn't matter what is the length of the string. It can be zero. It can be two, four, six, eight, ten, hundred, any even number. But you can, you should be able to break it into half so that the first part is exactly the second part. Is this regular? Can you use your intuition to say that it is regular? Is it? It is regular. This is not regular. Why? Because it defies this finite limitation of the automaton. Because you do not know where this language will will, will be split, right? So, so first of all, you need to figure out what is the split point. 
And once you figure it out, you need to keep, you need to remember everything that you find beginning from the starting position till this split point. And then you have to match everything exactly. And since this could be of arbitrary length, so it requires arbitrary memory and therefore it is not regular. So this is an intuitive argument, but we can prove using pumping lemma that this is not happening. Why? So I, I can give you an intuitive proof over here. Suppose that this is WW. So you take a string WW. Suppose uh, any string on W and W. So, so that the length of W is P. So W and W is length 2P, right? Now break it anyway. Whatever way you like to break X, Y, and Z such that the condition 2 and 3 apply. If you satisfy condition 2 and 3, condition 1 will never be able to satisfy because either you will increase ones or you will increase zeros or you will increase uh, something which will make it asymmetrical, right? So, so you will have a split point. So either you will have a larger string on the left-hand side of the split or a larger string on the right-hand side of the split. It is impossible to have an equal distribution. Yes. Yes. Okay, regarding quiz and last class. So before we leave, uh, last so the last class of this week, uh, that is on Saturday, it will be completely online. Okay, I will not come on campus. It will be completely online. Yes. So it is online, so we, we don't have to cover, right? Sure. Okay. From from next next quiz, we can we can keep that in mind. But this quiz, I I don't think there is any problem, right? Is there any problem? No. If you want, we can move it to Tuesday. Is it with everyone? You want to move it, move it to Tuesday? And then things that we will cover on Saturday will also be included. Okay. So there is a trade-off. So what do you think? Okay, so you can you can do a, a, a poll at your own and let me know by tomorrow. Sir, what will be the timing for the quiz? Uh, the timing of the quiz will be, since it's online, so we will start the quiz. I will post the quiz uh, at the start of the class. And then I will give you like, it, it, it would not be a long quiz. It would be 10 to 15 minutes quiz. So you will have 15 minutes, maybe one question, not long, and then you are. Sure, so we will have to solve it on paper and upload right, it on animation. Yes, right? Not necessary. Yes, the quiz uh, will be online. And what, what happens is uh, you solve your quiz on a piece of paper, then scan it, make it a PDF, and upload it on LMS. I will, I will, I will open it. Scanning and submission, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I will give you a few extra minutes for that. So that's all for today. If you have any other question, please let me know. Otherwise, we will end the class. And thank you very much for your time. And I'll see you on Saturday uh, with, with Chris. Um, sir, one more thing. Uh, have we yes. done everything included in the P set one? Yeah, everything. I mean, everything that we have covered in class. No, I'm asking uh, is everything that is including the problem set done so far? Oh, okay. I don't know. Let me check. Because I think the last question has something to do with, uh, with the topic that we haven't covered yet. It is actually covered, but yeah, it is. We, we can skip that question. The last one. Yeah. Okay. And what's the exact deadline for the, uh, for the problem set? Is uh, it to a midnight of 19? Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes. What's your question?